All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, our guests are Jacob Hess and Carol Rice from Public Square Magazine. You guys wrote an article a few days ago entitled Culture War Comes to Church in regards to what's happening in a lot of the wards across the United States, especially maybe in the stakes. Um, Carol, what initiated this? Why did you feel the need that you needed to write this article? Well, I was hearing stories like the one that we shared in the article often. I I would find that anytime I would gather with a group of people, um, two or more, (laughs) um, it seemed like comments like this were being raised. Um, Stories like this were being shared. And I just started to really see that it, it wasn't an uncommon thing. It was something that a lot a lot of us are experiencing. Um, I think Jacob had very similar experiences in the work that he's been doing at Public Square for literally years now. Um, I, I think he's jumped into a lot of these, and so it was a it was a pretty natural fit for things that have I know been on his mind that we've talked about. I know we said earlier that this was just something that has percolated for a while. And sometimes, uh, Jacob always kind of kids, if you have something burning under your, you know, burning your fingertips, you've just got to write. He's always extending that invitation. And and this was one of those things. It really was. I just, I hear about it a lot and felt a need to address it, say something. Okay, Jacob, I'm going to open up here with your, the opening uh, tagline here, basically. And here's what it says, quote, with a cultural war raging around us, perhaps it shouldn't surprise us to see it leaking now and then into our congregations and classes. But that doesn't make it any easier to know how to respond. There's two parts to this. Number one, there's always been a culture war, right? We, we've always seen this. You go back to the 90s and the Clinton era and, and, and what was going on there with the GOP, for example, and, and the dams and go back to the 60s. You know, there, there's, there, there, there may be times when, when it gets a little bit more intense. For me, it's usually that a lot of that has to do with technological changes that, that end up bringing these cultural changes about. But what makes this different than it was even five years ago? I mean, this is this wasn't here yesterday, it seems. Now, you know, five years ago, maybe, is when it really started to come about. Why, why is this different now? I'd like you to answer that question. I would love to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, I honestly don't know the answer, but I just, I confirm what I think both of you feel, that it we're seeing a mounting animosity around us. I've been showing my boys the Lord of the Rings movies, you know, they're finally of age. And, you know, all the Lord of the Rings movies start with like the darkness is growing, you know, like it just feels even the last six months, we were just commenting on how some of the attacks against the church have just been getting better and more uh, harder to deal with. And the anger and the animosity, the personal attacks against all of us, I mean, yourself included, Greg. It's just growing. And this is not just our observation. Commentators across the nation, including atheists like John Haidt, are just saying, what's going on? It's like we're losing our capacity. Ten years ago, my atheist Marxist friend said, Americans are losing their capacity to disagree in productive ways. And that that's just gotten, it seems like that's continuing. The cancer spreading. So I don't know. It's an important question. I, I would suggest a couple things. I know that I'm answering a little bit of my own question here, but I, I would say a lot of that has to do with um, a softening of the belly, right? I, I think that um, especially, and I think the church specifically is a, a very easy target for these things because we we are in a, a lot of very, very positive things in our culture, obviously, but I think one of the negatives is we're just really nice. And and before you say, well, Greg, you're a monster white, what's wrong with being nice? 
I would say, I, I think that nice is a very passive thing. I think it's, you know, kindness to me is something that, okay, that makes sense to me. Kindness is, is uh, uh, of commission, right? And, and, and niceness is more omission. And we also have in our culture a kind of this feeling of, well, if the prophet didn't say it, then I'm not doing it, or, or I'm waiting. You know, it kind of goes against the DNC verses that say, you know, don't be a slothful servant and don't be compelled in everything that you do. And yet, I think there's this sense that we just kind of wait around for things to be brought about. And, and I think that that has put us in a position where, unless the church has very specific messaging, which they have not yet, very specific messaging on these ideologies and these things that are coming in now, what I call the religion of academia, um, then, then it's almost like, well, what do we do? How, why, how do I respond? What should I say? You know, and, and where we do get generalities, I don't, there hasn't been a real specific message on, on a number of these things. Do you guys feel that way at all? If, it, if it's, if you're talking about like gender ideology and yes, critical race theory, then I think you're right. I would, I, I want to know what Carol thinks. If I could add to what you said, Greg, John Haidt says, consistent with your analysis before, there have always been conflicts at the university. There have been always, always been people getting mad and protests. But he said in 2014, something shifted. He said he had students come in and start to say things like, I was psychologically damaged by what my professor said in class. <laughs> and he's like, that was brand new. Mm -hmm. And if, if we take that as a little bellwether, it does seem like there's something new with this idea that disagreement on important questions is a bad thing. And then if you fall on the wrong side of the cultural orthodoxy with sexuality or gender or race, you're not just wrong in the eyes of some, you're like someone to be confronted and, you know, and e evil in another way. Mm -hmm. And the church that represents these unpopular views becomes something to confront. And so why don't you stay in the church and help make it better? I think that has something to do with it. The intrusion of this ideology where people are so horrified by doctrines that we would consider fundamental to Judeo-Christian teaching for centuries, that they're confronting us now like mm -hmm. we're objects to be confronted and and some of the most ugly stories we're hearing seem to have that in the in the mix of it carol i think that kind of like we said in the article that because we're not amish and and that's not a diss on the amish <laughs> because we aren't amish you know, one of the things you'll hear members of the church say often is we, you know, we need to live in the world, but not of the world, right? And our world is changing fast. And so I'm not surprised to see that things are happening in our wards and on our stakes that correlate with those things that are going on in the world around us. Um, I would agree that there is some I don't know if the word is confusion about being Christ-like. And like you said, there being a distinction between kindness and niceness. I would maybe use the word, I, I don't know. I, I would describe it as wanting to be Christ-like, right? Like if we say we're being, we want to be kind or we want to be nice, that we want to be like, we want to be like Christ. And we have a tendency to make God in our own image. And so we have a tendency to take that trait of Christ that we feel like we're most likely to represent, right? And say, I'm doing those things. And so therefore I, I'm a good person and I'm being like Christ. And then anything that's not like that is now all of a sudden antichrist or it's evil or it's back or it's black or it's dark. So it's just really easy. And that's why I think we get into this you know, why I'm comfortable calling this a war, because um, we've just lost that ability, like Jacob was saying there too, when he was quoting Jonathan Haidt, we've just lost that ability for civil discourse um, surrounding some of these things. And I, I, I think that's one of, one of the big problems is just paint with very broad strokes, anybody who doesn't 
sound or look exactly like, you know, like us. Mm -hmm. Now you start off here with a, well, a lot of the article here is, is a friend of yours. I'm guessing she's a, a, a a mutual friend of yours, but you know, you've got her name in here as Cammie and a lot of what you've built in this article is around some of her remarks. And this is not abnormal, right? These are, these are the same remarks we were talking before we started recording. I, I get, I, 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 again, I don't know the exact number, but I'm going to guess somewhere between 100, 120, 130 different comments from members of the church about what is happening in their wards. And it, from a, 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 there, there is, there are new comments, there's new vocabulary, new approaches that are happening on a regular basis now. And it seems to be getting, the divide seems to be getting bigger and bigger. And so Cami here, she starts off with a few different things. I'm just going to run through a few different examples here. She says there was an edge to some of the comments. This is in Relief Society that just felt off. She has examples of uh, an opening prayer for sacrament meeting that she saw one sister began with de dear heavenly parents. I've, I've seen that firsthand, by the way. Or another woman explaining it was important to understand that general authorities are for just are are for just general, but not specific counsel for us. I hadn't heard that one before. Um, but uh, so many of these things, I, I believe the root of all of these things, it comes down to critical theory, which is something that has, 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 has fomented in the universities. And it's, you know, the very basic way to look at critical theory it divides groups into an oppressor and a victim. And so whether it's any kind of identity that you're looking at, and I think this is why the brethren have focused so much on this identity hierarchy from President Nelson of child of God, number one, and then child of the covenant and disciple of Christ, and then everything else falls below that. Because these are all about identity, and, and, and your identity tells you you're either in the victim side of things or on the oppressor side of things. And the comments here that I see and that I get so many times are almost always falling under, un, under that type of a dynamic. Um, the, the general authorities are for general, but not specific counsel for us. See that to me are, is already saying I'm pushing off authority. Right. And, and I don't know if you guys have had any other questions you've received back or, or based on some of these things that you're hearing if you see a lot of that as well, do you see that there is kind of this pushback on the authority on the brethren specifically? Because to me, it's rooted in the church is oppressive and the brethren are oppressive. It's a bunch of old white guys and uh, they just need to get up with the times. Jacob? For sure. I, I think there is another strong ideology that paints a very different picture than the Christian view. I mean, just taken from the New Testament, the Christian view is we all sin and we all fall short of the glory of God. We're all messing up <laughs> and we all got to do better. We all need to repent. And that other religion you're describing, and you're not the only one. I mean, Tom Stringham has written about that for us. John McCorder at Columbia University, African-American scholars talked about this, taking on quasi-religious dimensions. but. Um, it does paint a picture of the people that need to repent are those people, the oppressors. And, and if you're in a marginalized group, you, we hear this language all the time. Uh, we hear people say to a member of the marginalized group, you're perfect. <laughs> you are perfect. <laughs> I mean, like, if there's anything less Christian than that, I don't know. I mean, like, that's not what Christ taught. We all have things to improve on. So, and that is very divisive. I know that the people who believe it don't intend it to be divisive. I think they intend it as like, this is how we help the world improve by confronting the inequities, confronting the injustices, and then we'll move towards their version of Zion. But in practice, I think it's inevitably divisive. I was in a conversation with some students at the University of Utah and they were bragging about confronting inequities on campus and confronting sexism and confronting an instance here, you know, little microaggressions. And I, I stopped them and I said, okay, 
I just want to ask you a question. I said, if I went home tonight and decided I want to improve my marriage, and so I'm going to confront my wife on any instance where she, where something's not fair, or any language that she shares that's not like meeting my needs or something, how well do you think that would improve our marriage? <laughs> And it was so obvious, like, that's not going to get us where we need to go. But the point I'm making, Greg, is I think a lot of people sincerely believe it will. I don't think they're doing it to try to be divisive. I don't think they thought through, like, the long-term consequences. No. Carol, it it says in here, and specific in this quote, it talks about uh, when you're kind of pushing things off. Another part of this is that uh, Cammy goes into is that... uh, talking about the balance of power between heavenly father and heavenly mother as if that's you know some big thing we need to be talking about but then it talks and says there's a knowledge that uh that we can pray to receive revelation about this and other comments she makes are t- very focused on well the brethren say this but we need to take on personal revelation you know and that kind of trumps everything else that uh that we might be receiving from the brethren um how <laughs> Isn't there a, a proper balance to that, don't you think, that we need to have? I mean, we do need personal revelation, but we don't get personal revelation for the church, right, or for, or for the stake, unless we're the stake presidency, or for the ward, or, or for the church as a whole. Correct. Um, Elder Renland gave a beautiful talk about personal revelation, where he talked about the framework that, that revelation needs to work into. Remember, he talked about staying in your own lane. He talked about, um, so first of all, who are you receiving revelation for? He talked about um, personal revelation aligning with prophetic counsel and wisdom that we've already received and it aligning with the scriptures. And so in, in, in a lot of these cases where people claim personal revelation to step away from the church right now, personal revelation that it's okay if I don't wear my 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 garments, even if I'm in doubt that you know I'm not comfortable, so I don't need to wear it. Personal revelation for a lot of different things in their lives that that doesn't align with what our modern day prophet with the scriptures with the doctrines you know of the church teach us. Then they're conflating this idea of personal authority with what actual personal revelation is and um, whether some are doing that intentionally or they're just deceived. I, that's not our, that's not ours to call out. Right. But I think that we need to be aware that that happens a lot. I think I, I see it a lot in social media and I definitely hear about it a lot in conversations. And I think just, conflating, confusing, distorting those really important elements, those sensitivities to the spirit are one of the ways that we can kind of get ourselves in trouble. Yeah, definitely. And again, I go back to that idea of critical theory with that. It's, it's, am I pushing off the authority and, and, and saying I'm liberated from that in a sense, and I get my own revelation for what the church should be doing. Right. Right. And it's, Anyway, so she goes, Cammy goes on here and she says she had this experience in, in Relief Society where there was really some some more things going on, talking about the power balance between Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. She says after the class, she went back to put some books away in a closet and a row of women stayed back waiting to talk to her and they shared their concerns. And the more I reflected on all that was happening, the more I became worried as well. Right. So they're worried about these comments that are being made, things that, again, we didn't see more than a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Two things on this. Well, let me finish her quote here. She says, many of these sisters had changed. Women who had a long history of positive influence in our ward. So we do need to realize that when these things are coming in, it is something new, right? This is something beyond tradition, beyond what culture we've usually seen it's it is a change. The question is: Is the change good, right? Because you do need to change sometimes. We've seen a, a, an awful lot of changes under President Nelson, right? So it's, but they're 
they're trying to create the change here at a at a personal and award level sometimes and beyond. It, it to me, it's more like a a bottom up uh, revelation process instead of a, a top down revelation process. But she they wait they waited after the class because they were worried to talk to her. One of the things I try to talk about, and it's just my interpretation and my belief on this. Again, talking about how I think we're too nice. Um, is that you need to speak up. It, it's important to speak up. It, that there are tools in these ideologies that are used, and, and they're mostly tolerance and compassion. And so when you speak against those things, you, people are always afraid to do it because they figure that, well, I'm going to be seen as not tolerant or I'm going to be seen as not compassionate. And, and yet these are, these are, to me, oftentimes misplaced. And I think it's important not to fall into what has been coined as the spiral of silence, where you almost feel like you're, you're emotionally bullied not to say something, or in our culture, in the church, that you don't want to be contentious, which we don't want to be contentious. But there is a difference between trying to be contentious and contending right? Standing up for what you believe or, you know, like lift where you stand, <laughs> stand up for something as Gordon B. Hinckley said. And, and so in that culture we've talked about in the church, it, it would be great if in this example, the women said something in class about it. And, and, and I, I know that's going to cause conflict. I understand that will cause conflict, but if culture continues to move, and, and if the church is not going to continue to move with that culture, it's going to create conflict. There's no way around that. Do you see it that way? Jacob, do you see it like that? I think I, I do. And one of the things we feel strongly about at Public Square is encouraging people to do just what you're describing. Um, it might be a little scary to raise your voice, but we have to. And, and that doesn't mean that you're causing contention, as you're saying. It might be perceived that way, and people might accuse you of that. But that's been true all the way back to, you know, Laman and Lemuel accused Nephi of being too mean. And you know, it's just always been, I wrote a piece called The uh, Silencing of the Lambs for Deseret News about this, about how faithful believers are getting scared into silence. Um some of the people that who follow the ideologies you describe are not silent and they're they they're often more willing to raise their voices and by the way i would one other thought um if many of them believe that activism is the way the church has always changed if you read the um you know the, the salt lake tribune wrote a piece about how activism has been so important in the changes of the church. So you, they look back at the history of the church and they sort of take credit as an activist class at all the different things that have changed. That's um, distorted on many levels. There's lots that we could say about that. But it is a sincere belief among some that the future of the church will be based on their own activist you know, influence. And eventually the church will move in this direction because the activists have pressed enough. So in that mindset, the activism is central to the church's growth and possible possibility. I, uh, Carol, in, in, in here, she talks about uh, another friend who lives on the East Coast, and she'd been experiencing some things with the young women leaders. And by the way, of all of the auxiliaries, priesthoods, and everything else in the church, those messages that I've been giving, get, been receiving from listeners, the number one problem is young women in, in the young women's organization. That's where it, it seems to pop up the most. Um, and I do think that this type of, because compassion and tolerance are used as these tools, almost sometimes bullying tools, I think that young women are the most susceptible to all of this. And it's the easiest place to go with it. Um but she talks about how the, this woman in the East Coast went on to describe similar, seeing similar language of these comments 
in social media posts by acquaintances. Now you brought up Jonathan Haidt. Um, this is something he really focuses on and how social media has changed the game. When, when the iPhone came out in 2008, and then you have the like buttons that were added on to Facebook, and then later on with all the other apps, Twitter and et cetera, um, that changed everything. Right. The, 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 the feedback, the emotional response, the, okay, I'm liked that people like what I say has changed everything. And on the other hand, I better be darn careful about what I say because people are going to really come after me if, if I'm not saying the politically correct thing. And that's kind of translates onto comp campus behavior, but it, it translates into church behavior now. Same thing here. She's seen these social media posts and, and looking at those things. I look through a lot of social media with a lot of different influencers on, on let's say, both sides of these, these ideologies. Um, how, how influential is social media in, with church members when it comes to this new culture war that is, that is coming into the church? Oh, I think it's profound. I think it's profound. Um, I think there's a very good reason why one of the first things that President Nelson, when he became prophet, told the women of the church, he taught the youth, he taught the women, and then he taught the youth, and then he talked to us generally about like how to take a social media fast. And um, I was working for a, a school in the area. And I, I remember at the time, the kids, you know, being very sincere about taking social media fasts. And, um, you know, the women that I, a lot of women that I knew taking social media fasts when he asked us to do that, I, I think it's, I think it's very telling that it's one of the first things that he taught us to do and that he started with the women. Because I do think that something else that President Nelson said that I rely on often and think about is that he said, if the women of the church lose their moral rectitude, the world will never recover. And I, I think that's a very profound statement as well, because I like, like his wife, Wendy, has reminded us, he doesn't speak in hyperbole. And if you think about the ramifications of what he said, it's very important for, for women to maintain that moral rectitude. And then the opposite of it would be would be true too. So I think social media has been a big game changer because if you think about it, it's not just, people aren't just looking at this like, oh, I said something that people like, or I said something that people dislike, but what about people who are never speaking up, who are just scrolling through and see the kinds of things that have a lot of likes? That influences us as well. Whether we're speaking up or not, we're influenced by it. Jacob, have you have you uh, in reading Jonathan Haidt, have you have you brought that in and understood that to be a also a dynamic for what we're seeing in the church? Yeah, sure. He's, he does it. such. By the way, for those that don't know, and we've talked about Jonathan Haidt many times, but uh, Jonathan Haidt is a best-selling author and, and a, a social psychologist that has really done a, a fabulous job. And he's an atheist, but he's done a fabulous job on on describing some of the phenomena that we are seeing today. Yeah, I interviewed him a couple of months ago. And the, the, by the way, well said, Carol. The thing that stood out to me is he talks about social media like a dart gun. Like if you say the wrong thing, lots of people fire darts at you. And, and he said his diagnosis is that's making us all stupider because we hold back. We don't actually say what we think. And so like, there's a lot of people, majorities of liberals and conservatives now don't say what they really think. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes this kind of weird collective group think, you know, back in John F. Kennedy's day, the group think was, okay, we can't disagree with the president. So let's go into the Cuba and the whole Bay of Pigs fiasco is because people didn't feel like they could disagree mm -hmm. with the party line. So I think our ability to know truth and to have it confirmed to us gets threatened. And I mean about everything, not just about questions around God. And that's pretty frightening. So I do feel like we need to remember that we're defending 
some of the basic principles our country was built on here. We might sometimes feel like, you know, people sometimes treat us maybe like the crazies. Those crazy right wing. But these are some of the basics in America that are now under question. This, this idea that people can disagree and not try to destroy each other and that we can we can govern together across disagreements. You know, the new religion that you describe is bringing that into question, you know. There is this right way to think. And if you're not on board with it, should you even teach at a university, you know? Right. Should you even be allowed to say things? Um, that is new. That's not a continuation of, <laughs> this is a new thing. Which and I think that's a part of your work, Greg. You're drawing attention to this new thing. That's well, why you've been targeting. Drawing, drawing down the liberal order, really, right? It's just it's just pulling down the liberal order. Um, yeah. Now, something that is because of those that are are starting to change a little bit, and 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 a lot sometimes, and and are starting to grab onto some of these new ideologies. Um, it creates new flashpoints and. Um, new things become controversial that were never controversial before. In 1995, uh, under Gordon B. Hinckley, the church came out with a family proclamation. And it seemed like nothing at the time. It was nothing. It's like, well, why are you repeating this? Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. It's okay. We got it. Okay. This. That was fun. Great. And, uh, you know, you got specific language in there about gender and actual gender roles and family and and a number of things in there that are now a controversial point within the church. And, and here's a part of that spiral of silence. You know, I, I, I've seen, I have had on two occasions, me personally, and then I get this all the time in some of these comments I talked about, back to me, feedback. People say, don't talk about the family proclamation, right? You can't talk about that because it is going to offend some people. And because it's going to offend some people or they don't want to hear it, you can't talk about it. This has happened in, you know, a while back, even in several years ago in, in, in a bishopric meeting. This happened in in uh, in a stake meeting that I was in. This has happened in those. Those two are my two examples where there was actually feedback from church leadership at local levels saying, no, don't bring up the family proclamation. And my wife. uh my wife and I were speaking together. This was not in our ward. This was in a different ward, but she had a talk and she wrote it. And then she, you know, she didn't say anything to me until after she, she gave the talk, but it was about, you know, a lot of it was about the family proclamation. It was bringing up the family proclamation and she sat down and then, and then afterward, after church, she said, you know, I actually felt kind of funny. I felt, I felt like, should I have said that? Should I have actually brought that up and talked about that? And, and she says, you know, and she does say, I thought about that before, but then I thought, of course, I'm going to do that, right? I'm, I'm, of course, I'm going to talk about that. And I'm not going to let these feelings hold me back from being able to talk about that. Isn't that cultural shift that we're seeing, because that, that, that is a cultural shift, is, to me, is, is saying, it's part of that spiral of silence. Don't talk about this or don't talk about that. How, how would that harm the church at a ward and stake level? How can that harm anything that's brought up? And I'm not talking about just the family proclamation, but the ideas behind it in, in what talks are given and what lessons are given and what material you use and what material you hold back from. I saw a, a very, <laughs> I say this, um, I saw a very popular Come Follow Me show. And when the week came to talk about the family proclamation, I think it was maybe the last one, they, they didn't talk about it. They went on to something else. And I thought, God, you know, I why? Come on. Come on. See, that to me is just, it's the spiral of silence. Yeah. And, and if you keep feeding that, what you get back it, it just it's just a cycle that perpetuates and and gets worse and worse and worse. How do we step out of that? How, how are we going to step out of that cycle? Carol, this is your question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I have so many thoughts, guys. Where to start? <laughs> Wherever you want, bring them on. 
Okay. I'm old enough to remember, maybe you guys aren't, when President Benson told us that we were under condemnation because we weren't reading the Book of Mormon. Do you remember that? Well, I remember that talk, yes. And he said we needed to flood the earth with the Book of Mormon. And and I remember taking that really seriously because the idea of us collectively being under condemnation for something was really actually kind of terrifying to me because I thought, well, the Savior is not going to come to a group of people who are under condemnation. So we, we, you know, like we better start reading our Book of Mormon, better start sharing our Book of Mormon. Um, I think the consequence of what you're saying, Greg, is that we get to a point where we're not teaching vital doctrine that is that is absolutely essential to our understanding the plan of salvation. And, and we could put at risk within our families, within our wards, our young women, our precious children, that we put at risk coming under condemnation individually, maybe collectively, that's not mine to say, um, for not teaching this vital doctrine. There's nothing in the proclamation that is not taught in ancient and modern scripture. It's a compilation of things that we already believe and preach. And so not bringing it up is just ignoring the actual saving doctrine of, of the doctrine of the family. It was Julie Beck who said, anything that's anti-family is anti-Christ. And those yeah. are some strong words but we're learning about that this week as we study Malachi, right? God will organize his human family from Adam until our current day. And he, and he does that through the structure of the family. And Truman Madsen said, you know, our, our family structures are really messed up. He said that decades ago, literally, right? How, what does that mean for where we're at today? And so um, we can't ignore the order of heaven. And, and that's what the family is. So I have lots of thoughts about that. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Jack, Jacob, anything to add to that? Oh, beautiful, Carol. She's, mm -hmm. You've worked for so many years with trying on this very issue. I really... Love what you said. The only thing I would add is maybe the elephant in the room. Maybe even majorities of Americans and even members have become convinced that there is a certain group of human beings for whom the gospel doesn't work, the proclamation doesn't work, the church doesn't work. And from that mindset, the church becomes what they call, and this is one of those words, Greg, heteronormative, right? It works for most people, but not for those people. And I just want to say that because this is a sincere belief of even some people I really care about. Right. And if you believe that, all of a sudden the covenant path isn't this path for everyone. The covenant path is just for those heterosexual people, right? Right. And that, again, <laughs> there's a lot we should, can and should say, and the prophets have said about that belief. I'm just making the point that if you believe it, it changes everything. It really bleeds into everything. It has ripple effects. We've seen families, all of us, uproot themselves and say, I can't be a part of that because of this. So um, that's why I think more scrutiny of this ideology is so critical, Greg, in connecting with your work. I know you get beat up for it. You get attacked for it. But, but a, a big part of your work is like, hey, can we have a deeper conversation about these ideas? Because um, so much attention is going to like church doctrine. I mean, people de deconstruct it and scrutinize it all over. What if we also scrutinized the secular ideology, the doctrines, right? At least let's be equal opportunity players. Let's investigate right. the whole thing. Right. What is going to lead us to eternal happiness? Which of these ideologies? So 
Great comments, Carol. You too, Jacob. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, to your point there, Jacob, it's, is is the atonement universal or not? Right. Is it is it a universal thing? It did did Christ take on the sins of the world and the struggles of the world and everything else for just some people? And and I think I think categorically that answer is no. It was it was for everyone all yeah. the time. Yeah. And I think they would agree with that. They would say we've just adopted some provincial ideas that limit that, you know. Yeah. Um if it weren't for that pesky doctrine that tells us that family is the order of heaven. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's so strange to me that, you know, I, going back to that quote you said, uh, Carol, from uh, from Julie Beck, right? If it's anti-family, it's anti-Christ. I believe that wholeheartedly. I, I think that unless you can understand how those things are tied together, um, the, the family is... All of these ideologies, this is, a, this is a good exercise, all of these ideologies that are based in critical theory, especially when you focus on what I would, you know, identitarianism, they all attack the traditional family, all of them. And, and, and if you just look at that, you, those darts you're talking about, they're, they're coming in from all sides against a traditional family. And you should ask yourself, why? Why would all of these things be focusing on a traditional family? And, and, but they do. Now, <laughs> this to me here is, you talk about, Jacob, talking about these things. This is my concern in the church, is we, we don't talk about these things. So I don't know if they're unpleasant or we've just got too much else to do. We've got families to take care of, or things to do. But even at a ward level, a a in in leadership positions the idea that anything like this discussion we just had or anything even close to it has happened i i don't know how often that has happened maybe it's happening more than i think it is but i don't think it's happening very often you you put up the question here well let me get, read your statement here you say the church has provided a remarkable amount of protection across many areas especially for those living their covenants from the heart. But why is this particular storm, religion of academia, these ideologies, whatever, of cultural hostilities reaching and affecting, affecting us so much? And why are our defenses not holding in this case? Now, you don't supply an answer to this, but I think it is a very good open-ended question for anybody reading your article and to think about. Why are our defenses not holding? Because they're not, right? This, this, is, this is seeping in, and, and it's getting bigger and bigger. I, I think we're at the very tip of the iceberg with this right now, in my opinion. Um, any ideas on how we increase our defensive position of this, the ability to defend against things that would go against a traditional family, that are anti-Christ, that are really things that are going to be attacking the church. And you you don't do light things on your show, do you? I'm mean, <laughs> no, no kidding. No questions about. So I think a part of why it's been so effective in coming in is we, it's our own brothers and sisters who are absorbing these ideas, often from influencers or college and the ideas are not presented as another religion, Greg, you know that. They're presented as basic psychology and basic mental health principles. And they're presented as, um, you know, sociology and social work. And they're just, they're presented as unquestioned truth in the world. When in actuality, some of what is being carted into the church is fundamentally at odds not just with the doctrine of the family, but with basic Christian teaching, like what Jesus himself says. <laughs> I don't think that's clear at all to lots of people. And, and I, I want to give people the benefit of the doubt and, and just say, I think a lot of them sincerely believe that they're coming to see more of God's truth. And that what they now understand about gender ideology and race and, 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 um, 
you know, transgender issues is their own progression to a more advanced, nuanced, enlightened spirituality. And now they know, Greg, unlike maybe some of the rest of us, God's true love, <laughs> you know, the true understanding of compassion. Um, so if that's true, I'm still not answering your question. Like, if that's true, what do we do about it? I think you're right. I think we need to talk about it. I think we need to talk about it generously, not in a warfare mode, not with a heart at war. I think the people that don't talk about it are scared to cause conflict. And I think that's why it's so important to say we can have serious conversations. We can sit down together and talk about these things and have hard conversations as brothers and sisters in the gospel. So that's my own feeling. And, and in that conversation, we've got to be able to share what we really think and our concerns. That's what we're, That's everything we're trying to do at Public Square. A healthy public square means we can do this. Mm. But if we start to be like, oh, no, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm not going to say what I think. No, we're not going to play that game. Yeah. That's a dangerous yeah. game. Yeah. Uh, Carol, were you going to say something? I was just going to add to that. I, I won't take a lot of time. I, I did a lot of interviewing in preparation for this article and some other projects that we're working on. And in one of the interviews that I conducted, there was a young woman who talked about how in their ward, they just try to um, make it a really safe place for people who believe a broad range of things can come and be really comfortable. And there's one particular sister that they're trying to gear their their tolerance towards. And I said, that's, you know, like, that's fascinating. How's it working? How, how is she feeling there? How is that, you know, like, how's that going? And um, the particular sister that they were trying to gear everything to has left the church. She's not there. And so it got me thinking, where did the, where did the tolerance I, I mean, tolerance, I, I would have to define that word, right? But where did the tolerance in this case get that word? What, what, what beautiful gospel truths did they miss out on talking that are truly the saving doctrines that we need to be taking time to talk about that we're not getting brought up for the sake of tolerance? And where, where did it get that word? Where did it get that particular sister? In this case, I, I don't think either were served. You know, you have, uh, I, I think about, you know, you've always got the the old school um, problems of of falling away from the church, you know, most tempt you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? <laughs> that, that's your like, the, they're, they're always there. It's always a problem. And our defenses are up about it. And at least, at least how to, how to fight it right? How, how you should do it. Not everybody does. It's a temptation. Those temptations are always there, granted. But to me, this is a whole new deal, right? This is, to me, these are the mists that we find in Lehi's dream, yeah. right? There's, there's a little bit of clarity out there. You can see a little bit, but you let go of the rod and you walk out into that mist and you're lost. And, and it seems to me that these, these physical traditional sins we've we've that we've always have fought off have now the 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 ideologies have become so sophisticated that we're moving from just kind of these carnal sins up into call it a spiritual sin in the sense that it's not just your body that that is that the that the adversary wants to work on it's your heart might mind and strength and these ideologies come in and they seem to grab all of that and you know, if you can grab that, it, it's it, it's it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ, and so now all of a sudden, and that's why we can talk about it as a religion, right? It, it's, it's if you can grab those things, you've got a real problem now. It's not just a matter of wow, I I, I can I need to repent from this X Y Z. It's like no, now I have I have I'm ideologically possessed. I've got a new ideology that that I want to follow, and the church doesn't agree with it. Now what do I do with this? Mm -hmm. right. Jacob, great. that was so great. I that analysis was 
just right. The miss. I'm, I'm going to cut that and put it right at the beginning when you say that. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really was good. And I, I just want to say, my, my wife the other day, um, she said it almost feels like people are trying to build two different churches. If we just take as an example of the miss you're describing, if you came to believe that the most important thing that we should be doing in the church is making sure everyone feels included and that they belong and make sure nobody ever feels uncomfortable. Let's just say for whatever reason, whatever influences you arrived at that conclusion, right? And we all know some of our influencers that we follow sure sound like this. (laughs) That's the most, and then they'll say things like, that's all that Jesus really cares about. He only really cares about people feeling included and belonging and loved, you know, like he walked around just petting lambs all day. That's all Jesus is about. If you believe I call that, that teddy bear Jesus, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you believe that, and then you listen to general conference, and then you listen to state conference, and then you go to elders quorum, you're going to get bugged a lot. You just are. And that right there, it is a mist. Because that's not just a carnal temptation that all the men fall into, you know? That's like, wait a minute. I thought it was being more loving. I I was convinced this is God's higher love. I believe a lot of members have drunk that Kool-Aid. And they they really sincerely believe it's the right thing. I want to keep reiterating that. I don't think they're trying to hurt the church. They just think they now understand God's true love. And one day, President Oaks will get there. One day, or, or one day, he won't be around, and the other apostles that we know agree with us will, will lead the church. It's a know? waiting game. They call themselves Elder Uchtdorf uh, members, you know, as if yeah. there's factions among the brethren. We yeah, know, yeah. That's, we know they're united. I've heard that too. Yeah. So that's there, there is obviously another church that many of us are trying to build, and that's do we care about inclusion and compassion and love? Yes. But there's a lot more to be said. That's why I think the love and law is so important. And and sometimes it's going to be very uncomfortable. Sometimes God, what I feel in prayer, asks me to change things. And I'm told by God that I'm not actually perfect. <laughs> I got I to gotta shape up as a father and a husband. Yeah. yeah. It's funny because these, again, these critical theory, these things sourced in critical theory, oppressor, victim, it entices you to be the victim because the oppressors are the bad guy. And if it's one or the other, well, I want to be the victim. And the problem with that is what it always does. It's the opposite, as you said, Jacob, perfectly about Christianity. It it places the problem out there, right? The problem is always out there. It's not inside of you. It's not that you need to improve and repent and assimilate to the word of God. It's the problems out there, and that's where our focus needs to be. That equity, that justice is out that's there. That's right. And I can be a part of that team, right? That's an easy team to be a part of <laughs> because I don't have to change myself. Um, Carol, I wanted to get your feedback on this also. Why are our defenses not holding in this case? I mean, if we are moving from, kind of, it seems to me, these carnal uh, uh, sins to a more spiritual, mental, emotional, type of sin, what do we do? I mean, what what kind of defenses can we rely on? That's a really good question, Greg. <laughs> um, I think that President Nelson's given us a clue in how much he talks about the temple and our covenants. I think that some of these changes that we're seeing in our congregations are different than the kind of learning that takes place in the temple. And I think that for the defenses to hold, that you have to be somebody who can enter the temple, who cherishes your covenants, and um, is taught in the temple. Because there's there's different level of teaching that takes place there. And I think we have to remember that our Our church, our gospel encompasses all of that. We are not just Sunday Mormons, right? Um, We don't just congregate in our chapels and our 
multi-purpose rooms on Sunday, but that we we live our gospel in the way that we minister to each other to, throughout the week and that we become his because of how we cherish and hold on to our covenants. It has everything to do with entering and being in the temple. Mm. That's a great answer. So it's very true. Um, I think, again, going back to Lehi's dream, it's such an anchor for me. I think that that is a temple vision and that holding onto that iron rod is, uh, is very much about, about the temple. Can I say one more thing, Greg? Yeah, I'll, Jacob, please. I'll be done. Um, this is the point at which some people say, why doesn't the church kind of get involved and push back against all this nonsense? You know, like, why don't the prophets sound like President Benson did? You know, I, I have people who wish President Nelson was President Benson, mm -hmm. but he's not. He's President Nelson. <laughs> and my answer to that, because I've I've wondered similar things is um, if the church wants to do what Carol just described and deliver the ordinances of exaltation, I think it, it can't do that and fight the American culture wars. I don't think it can do both effectively. Um, I used to say, I've said the same thing to those that have been concerned about the pandemic, you know, with more and more data coming out, there's clearly questions about the prevailing pandemic response. And, and I've told people the church can either deliver the ordinances of exaltation or confront the pharmaceutical industrial complex. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you, you can't do both. Like we have to keep our eye on the ball and focus on our mission. Members disagree about lots of things, including who to vote for for president and what kind of health interventions are best. And some, sometimes I think there's great wisdom in allowing that to not be our focus. I know some people have wondered, why hasn't the church like kept fighting gay marriage? You know, we've got to like fight every issue that's in line with our doctrine, but there's also a pragmatic side to this, this kingdom that says we have to pick our battles as well. And if the legislative battle around gay marriage, for instance, has been won, um, then, you know, the dynamic shift and sometimes the prophets are not going to be just calling us to warfare on everything. And there will be times, we know this is coming, where we are going to have to fight for our our freedom of uh, to practice our faith. So yeah. I just... I just want to affirm that I see great wisdom in what the how the prophets are leading us in all these areas. Yeah, um, I'm going to finish up here with you guys. Put out at the end of the uh, toward the end of the article, you offered uh, for readers to respond to a few short questions. Um, this was several days ago, maybe five days ago, that the article went up. Um, what kind of response have you had on that so far? Is there any data that you can share with us? Yeah, we've had almost 100 people answer. And two things. A, a slight majority agrees <laughs> that they have observed more conflict and contention in interactions among members of their congregation. Uh, for that, So 55% of people agree with that. 45% say they haven't observed any more conflict. So it's not everybody in every ward that's having these experiences. I have heard that in more progressive liberal areas, this happens more. I live in a rural part of Utah. I never see anything like this. Mm -hmm. So, And then we also asked if you've witnessed conflict, which of the issues has it revolved around? 67% um, described pandemic disagreements. Mm -hmm. uh, the second top answer was LGBT issues at, at about 59%. And then the third was national politics. From there, you go to women's roles, church history, race. But the top three were the pandemic, LGBTQ, and then national politics. Yeah. So we are going to be continuing to um, analyze this data and sharing more in the new year because our desire is, like you, like how do we help foster better conversations about this in a way that can diffuse some of this? I know when I've sat down with some of my really liberal friends, if I hear them out, 
and they hear me out, we tend to come away liking each other, mm -hmm. not feeling in each other's throats. Um, yeah. That's obviously outside of church, but like, how can we foster peace and raise our voice for truth when we need to? Absolutely. Especially in church, right? It's, it's like, no, you know, you don't need to bring politics into the church. It, it's uh, stand, you know, if there's politics that happen to support a commandment or anything else, just stand by the commandment. And, you know, you don't need to bring everything else in from uh, from from politics in there with the uh, the discussion on that. They are Carol Rice and Jacob Hess from Public Square Magazine. I really appreciate both of you coming on here and accepting the invitation. I thought this was a great discussion, and uh, I think the audience will enjoy it quite a bit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Thank you.